Welcome, everyone. And it's my pleasure to introduce an old friend and distinguished lawyer, Steve Hanlon. He's been on the front lines of several major uh, battles to secure civil rights and judicial reforms for most of his career. Uh, right now, he, after practicing years in Florida and DC, he has retired, ha ha, to St. Louis and swears he's having the most fun he's ever had in his life, working now as a an activist lawyer for um, issues of uh, judicial reform. Steve's been interviewed by the New York Times. He appeared on six, six, sorry, CBS's 60 Minutes to explain his work uh, to document the major deficiencies in the public defender system. And he was off and the often prejudicial uh, criminal processing procedures throughout the US. So Steve spoke to us back in uh, spring of 2017, and he's here today to update us on all the various uh, judicial procedures and processes that have been um, happening in the last few years as we've also had change in focus of our courts. And so he's still though in the critical legal fight to right some of the many systemic wrongs in our judicial system. So thank you, Steve, for joining us this afternoon. And we turn it over to you to give us your presentation. Thank you. I, um, after I've been practicing law for 55 uh, years and I finally figured out a way to get my name in the law firm. So my law firm is now Lawyer Hanlon. And uh, if you wanna read about what I'm doing right now, you can go to uh, www.lawyerhanlon.com and it, it'll give you some uh, information about what I'm doing. Um, I am not retired, by the way. <laughs> uh, so the three things we're gonna talk about today. Uh, one is public defense. And the other is what I call the criminal processing system. It's, I don't call it a criminal justice system. And I don't think it deserves to be called a criminal justice system. And the third thing we're gonna talk about is mass incarceration. And then we're gonna try and see if there's a relationship between public defense, the criminal processing system and, the, and mass incarceration and what, if anything, we can do about that. So here's my view of public defense. Oh, this is your last chance. If one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped, you're fired. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is easier. Yeah, we can handle this, okay? <laughs> my clients and I consider them heroes uh, on the order of Sisyphus, uh, the great uh, Greek hero who was constantly trying to push a stone, a huge stone up a hill without success. 
But I have come to the conclusion after working uh, on this problem for the last 25 years that you cannot do mass incarceration unless the whole justice system rolls over and plays dead. Uh, and that doesn't just mean public defenders. That means the judges. Uh, that means the prosecutors. Uh, that means the bar associations. That means the bar disciplinary committees. Uh, and I say this with a great deal of sorrow in my heart. I'm a, I, I, I'm a proud lawyer. Uh, I love the profession. Uh, I love the lawyers I've worked with and against in the profession. And it, um, I am truly sad to have to say this uh, 55 years down the line. My goal is uh, to make sure that this is not the principal legacy of my generation of lawyers uh, to the next. I have been accused and pled guilty to try that I am that I'm trying to blow up the entire criminal justice uh, system. I plead guilty to trying to blow up the entire criminal processing system to turn it into a criminal justice system. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we did a lot of work in the last uh, 20, or 30 years uh, with the Constitution, the Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution. Um, and at the conclusion of that, we determined even before the composition of the current United States uh, Supreme Court, uh, that the Constitution and a $5 bill in this area of the law will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Uh, we have really nothing to show for our efforts uh, in that uh, uh, regard. Uh, and that's a sad, sad thing uh, to say. Um, the one thing we have preserved, it's still there from 1984, is the Strickland case. Uh, Justice O'Connor wrote this opinion and she said, what is required under the Constitution is reasonably effective assistance of counsel pursuing to prevailing professional norms. Now you will hear me say that a lot today. Okay? Um, that standard has been criticized, but it has been my goal to quantify. That's called the performance standard of Strickland. I want to quantify that performance standard of Strickland. Justice Marshall dissented in that case, and he said, there's no grip there. You know, I can't get my hands around anything. Well, we want to have, a, we want to provide a grip for reasonably effective assistance of counsel pursuant to prevailing professional norms. Uh, we want to quantify that, okay? Uh, we're not talking about getting F. Lee Bailey at his prime here. We're just talking about reasonably effective assistance of counsel. Okay, and we don't talk about Cadillacs or Chevrolets. Or that. I don't know anything about automobiles, but I'm a lawyer and I do know what reasonably effective assistance of counsel is, especially when it's done pursuant to prevailing professional norms. Okay, now there's a very simple rule that we have had for all lawyers, all judges for over a half a century. Okay. Uh, and the rule, I'm going to break it down here for you in a minute, but basically it's a real sensible rule. It says that we will never, and we've sworn, every one of us have sworn when we were uh, sworn into the bar, that we would never represent more people than we could competently represent. Okay, that's really the only law, along with reasonably effective assistance of counsel, that you have to know today. It's not the Constitution. Okay, and so it's a, it's a rule that we have. We would never do such a thing, okay? But we have done it for a half a century and it has had terrible consequences. Now I'll break the rule down for you, but all you have to remember is don't take more cases than you can handle confidently. That would be true for an obstetrician. Hmm? That would be true for an air traffic controller. Hmm? And it is really true for a public defender who is, who is who's, whose clients are people who the state seeks to deprive of their liberty, okay? Now, 
The rule says a lawyer shall not represent a client if the representation involves a concurrent conflict of interest. Okay, what is a concurrent conflict of interest? A concurrent conflict of interest exists if there is a significant risk that the representation of one or more clients will be materially limited by the lawyer's re responsibilities to another client. Okay, I'm up to here with my clients. And the judge says, I want you to take 35 more. If I do, I'm going to have a conflict with every one of those clients because I don't have enough time to represent each one of them competently. That makes basic sense, right? Again, these are not, this is not novel constitutional law. This is just a rule. Don't do it. Okay. Well, what happens if that, if you got, you know that you have too many cases and you can't represent each one of these people, every single one of them competently, you shall withdraw from the representation of a client. If the representation of the client will result in a violation of the rules of professional conduct or other law. And the rule we're talking about here is the rule against having a concurrent conflict in simpler language, the rule against representing more people than you can competently represent. You must leave, okay? Well, what else must you do? Actually, at that point, the rule says you must, you shall take steps to the extent reasonably necessary to protect a client's interest, okay? Well, what kinds of steps would those be, okay? Well, as you'll see further on, you're gonna wind up representing some of these clients, but you can't represent all of the clients, okay? It's against the law for you to do that, but we've been doing it for 50 years, okay? Um, uh, you have an obligation to protect the clients that you can't represent. And that means that you're going to move to dismiss their case. And if they're in custody, that they be released. Okay. Because there's, the state is not providing a competent lawyer there to represent them. Now, how do we come to that conclusion? I first started doing my work in Missouri, not because I grew up here, but because there was things in place that were really good to do my work in Missouri. I'd done work in Florida and Massachusetts and Mississippi, and they wanted me to go to Tennessee. And I said, I'm not going to Tennessee. I'm going to Missouri. And they had a great chairman uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the Public Defender Commission, Doug Copeland, one of my favorite lawyers, small firm, uh, represents uh, school boards and businesses, had never uh, done any work in uh, criminal defense uh, before he became chair. He would be the um, uh, the lawyer, he got the Lawyer of the Year Award in Missouri. Uh, he got, uh, he was uh, president of the Missouri Bar, just a first rate human being. And he said something that I will never forget. After he started walking into those courtrooms and seeing what was going on, he said, and he was as despondent about it as I am, we have trained a whole generation of lawyers how not to practice law. So what do we do about that? Well, here's one of my favorite judges of all, Judge Laura D Denver Smith, Stith, uh, and we argued uh, state versus waters in front of uh, uh, Judge Stith in the Missouri Supreme Court, and we won four to three. Judge Stith wrote the opinion. What's state versus waters say? Effective, not just pro forma representation is required by the Missouri and federal constitutions, okay? Back to the Constitution. But judges cannot order public defenders to take more cases than they can handle competently. Hmm? Not only judge, must I tell you I can't do it, you may not order me to do that, okay? Even though you've been doing it for the last 50 years. Hmm? If the state cannot provide a reasonably competent lawyer, you must dismiss that case, okay? And you must release the person in custody. That's from 1981, Wolf versus Ruddy in Missouri, okay? This is all what we call hornbook law. It's the black letter of the law. There's nothing particularly intellectually exciting here, okay? It's the straight stuff, okay? Um, now, what Justice said in her opinion, it was a great opinion, and it's uh, provided us a remedy that we're trying to take all over the United States now. The case must be dismissed without prejudice, or you must dismiss without prejudice, all cases where the state cannot provide a reasonably competent lawyer. 
So what does that mean? Well, you better take care of those murders and rapes, okay? Concentrate your resources there because they're, they're, these are dangerous people who are going to have to be in prison. And I've done a lot of prison litigation in, in my life, and I have been in the prisons that have the worst of the worst, and they're in the worst of the worst conditions, okay? Um, so I'm no flower child on this issue. There are some very dangerous and seriously mentally ill and sometimes gang members uh, in this population, and they must, they are dangerous and must be put uh, behind bars. So we need to represent those people. But the other cases where, by and large, these people do not constitute, and we'll show you the percentages later on, a serious or a significant public safety risk, those uh, uh, people, we're not going to be able to handle their cases, okay? We're going to have to come up with something to do with that, but we'll show you that later. Now, we said, we're ready to go. Uh, we've won this case uh, in uh, State versus Waters in uh, uh, July 31, uh, 2012. And uh, Judge Stiff said, go forward. You've got a rule. You've got a protocol that says how many cases are too many. Go forward. And we immediately went forward. And we said, and it went into all the trial courts in Missouri, and we said, we can't do this anymore. I know we've been doing it for 50 years, but we can't do it anymore. Well, that was not too kindly received. Okay, a couple of months after uh, July 31 of uh, 2012, after we'd been doing uh, these motions to withdraw in the Missouri trial courts and they were tearing their hair out, a brilliant man, uh, a, a lawyer and an accountant, um, a Republican uh, state auditor, looked at the 1973 NAC standards, National Advisory Commission standards, that our Missouri rule had been based on. And he said, there is no there there, okay? There's nothing, I can see nothing to support the NAC standards. Now, what were the NAC standards? It was five guys, okay, sitting around a bar on a beach, at San Diego, in San Diego, and saying, and they had a little napkin there that they could write on, well, let's say 150 felonies, huh? That, that'll be the maximum. And let's say 400 misdemeanors, how's that? All right, let's have another round of drinks, okay? No data, no analysis, no research, no nothing, okay? And felonies, of course, could range from stealing over $100 to murder. So it was sloppy thinking, and uh, the state auditor, uh, Tom Schweik, God bless him, he's no longer with us, uh, said, uh, you know, that you can't ask judges to dismiss cases uh, based on uh, 1973 standards that were made at a bar in San Diego. Now, at that point, this is another great man, a really, truly great man who's no longer with us. He was my partner in crime. This is Dean Norman Lefstein. Uh, the Indiana School of Law. He um, is the architect of the modern indigent defense reform uh, system. And this took a lot of courage for him to say this. And he wrote it in his book, Securing Reasonable Case Solids. He said, and he's telling this to everybody, the judges, the public defenders, everybody, do not rely on the 1973 NAC standards, okay? That was very controversial for him to say, and it took a lot of courage for him to say it. There's another first for the Missouri that came, uh, I think, in 2017. Public defender named Carl Hinkebein, by any definition, a good lawyer. He's disciplined by the Missouri Bar and the Missouri Supreme Court for having an excessive caseload. This sends shockwaves through the system. You could lose your license if you had excessive ca uh, uh, caseloads. Again, this is not some subtle nuanced view of the law. It's obvious that a lawyer cannot handle uh, 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 150 felonies or 400 misdemeanors or anything like that and, and uh, be competent. So now public defenders start saying, what am I going to do here? Uh, I've, I've got these clients and uh, they're now telling me I could lose my license. Well, a lot of them stop. They, get, they leave the public defender's office. So now we gotta, we, we, we've got the, the ruling from the Missouri Supreme Court in the Waters case. And it says, if you can draw the line, 
reliably, then you can turn these cases down and we'll put the pressure on the system to change. So we did the Missouri project, okay? In 2014, we published it. And what we did in the Missouri project, it was, I went, to, I, I had the ABA with me, American Bar Association. We were gonna be responsible for the law and standards applicable to how do you determine that question? What's too much, okay? And then I wanted accounting firms and I found a great accounting firm in, in Missouri, Reuben Brown. And I want them to take this Delphi method and I'll tell you about the Delphi method in a minute and apply it. So I would have, and, and so they were re responsible for the data and analytics of this uh, Missouri project uh, study. That's what we were gonna do. Uh, now, what is the Missouri project? How does this thing work? Well, it's a two skill set endeavor, as I told you. We're responsible for the law and standards, ABA, I'm the project director, and, uh, and Ruben Brown is responsible for the data and analytics, okay? Uh, there you have it, major accounting firms. Now, after we completed the Missouri project, we did these studies, public defender workload studies in Louisiana, Colorado, Rhode Island, Indiana, Texas. We're now completing uh, New Mexico and Oregon. So we'll have a total of eight that are ABA. And there are even more, and I'll tell you about that later on uh, in this talk. So what we do is, uh, uh, in a nutshell, is we do, we get um, uh, two electronic surveys that we send out to public defenders and private practitioners. And we say to them, um, uh, here's the case types that you have. And they range from murder to rape to high felony, mid felony, low felony, high misdemeanor, low misdemeanor, probation violation, maybe sex crimes, about nine or 10 categories of case types. Hmm? And then we take all the case tasks that you need to do for each of those case types. I'm gonna show you this in detail in just a moment. So communicating with your client, investigating the case, researching the law, investigating the prosecutor's case, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we, for every one of those case tasks, uh, types, we apply a case task and say, how much time should it take to do that, okay? What it should mean back to reasonably effective assistance pursuant to prevailing professional norms, okay? So that's the electronic survey. And then we bring them together in an in-person meeting. And that's fun because you got 25 lawyers in a room, maybe 30, half public, half private. You're pretty sure they're gonna disagree because the, the public lawyers, if they're good and they're experienced, and that's what we have, they get enough money up front that they can actually provide reasonably effective assistance to counsel pursuant to prevailing professional norms to their clients. The public defenders on the other hand, uh, don't have that luxury. So we put them all in the same room and we say, how much time should it, re should it require under that test, reasonably effective assistance of counsel pursuant to prevailing professional norms uh, to communicate with your client in a misdemeanor case and then to investigate that case, okay? We go all the way up through misdemeanors, uh, low, high, and then we take felonies, low, mid, high, uh, rape, murder, probation violation. Okay. Got a little ahead of myself. This is the first time I've done this, so um, it's fun for me. Uh, the case types and the case tasks. Next time we'll put those up front a little bit more. All right. This is what we call a standards-based study. So why use the ABA standards for criminal justice, okay? Um, that's what we use, okay? Because Strickland, said reasonably effective assistance of counsel pursuant to what? Prevailing professional norms. And Padilla, which is in 2010, said, this is the United States Supreme Court, again, talking about Strickland. And it says, we have long recognized that prevailing norms of practice as reflected in American Bar Association standards 
are guides to determining what is reasonable. We're trying to figure reasonably effective assistance of counsel. These standards may be valuable measures of the prevailing professional norms, okay? That's what we're trying to do, measure these prevailing professional norms. And the Supreme Court has said that our standards in the ABA are valuable measures, okay? Of, effect, of the professional norms of effective representation. This picture is starting to fall together, right? You can kind of trace the creation of it. Now, who do we have determined who those standards are, okay? Who was in the room when it, where it happened, okay? Well, the Supreme Court said in another case in 2012, this is a fact we have to know, 94% of state convictions are the result of guilty pleas. And they relied on Department of Justice uh, statistics. So what we have now is a plea system. We used to have a trial system. Now we have a plea system. Kind of shocking when you stop to think about it, okay? The ABA criminal justice standards were developed and continue to be refined by tax forces made up of whom? Who was in the room where it happened? De prosecutors, defense lawyers, judges, and academics. Wow. How often do you get those people all to agree on something? Okay. So the prosecutors were in the room, and so were the judges, when these standards were developed. Okay. And we have agreement across the board on that. The, this is the most important question the study is, gonna, is, is going to ask and answer. What is reasonably effective assistance to counsel pursuant to prevailing professional norms? And what are those norms? Now, is there a criminal justice standard that is applicable to cases that result in a plea? Well, thank goodness there is. And it's a standard that we embrace wholeheartedly. And so do the prosecutors, so do the judges, so do the academics, okay? In every criminal matter, not in some, okay? Every criminal matter, defense counsel should consider the individual circumstances of the case and of the client and should not recommend the acceptance of a dis disposition offer, that's a plea, unless and until appropriate investigation and study of the matter has been, and the verb is very important, Completed, not kicked around with your buddies, not thought about on your way to court, not thought about after you met your court, your client in court and before you tried to do a plea uh, deal with the prosecutor in front of the judge. No, no, no. <laughs> this happens long before you get into a courtroom. Huh? And of course, you know, this, this is clearly not happening in American courts today. Such study should include. Now, what is it that you need to study? Well, first of all, you have to have a discussion with your client. You actually have to talk to your client, okay? And we're going to quantify how much time that might take. Okay? I'm, uh, should take, excuse me, wrong verb. Should take, okay? Not standing in a courtroom and meeting your client for the first time and uh, looking at the prosecutor's file and telling uh, your client you ought to take a plea on this, okay? An analysis of relevant law. An analysis of the prosecutor's evidence. Potential dispositions, plea, mm, conditional, probation. How do you get, uh, there's a lot of different ways we can resolve these cases, huh? Maybe pretrial, uh, maybe, maybe uh, uh, move this case out of the criminal justice system. And then most importantly, relevant collateral consequences. Now here's what's happening, okay? Our system for these people, and most of these people are victims of the criminal, the, the criminalization of poverty, homelessness, mental illness, and addiction that has occurred over the course of the last 40 years, okay? Now, what do we have to offer those people in the criminal processing system? Two things. One is a conviction, okay, which has horrific collateral consequences. This is the end of your life as you have known it. You now will have a horrible time getting a job, a horrible time getting an education, a horrible time uh, uh, getting in the military. 
all kinds of consequences, job opportunities, housing, public benefits, gone because of a, a criminal conviction of a misdemeanor that has no public safety consequences whatsoever. Urinating in public, fishing with illegal bait, loitering, uh, the list goes on and on and on, okay? And we have two things for you. We have a conviction which will live with you for the rest of your life and destroy your life. Or we have a cage, okay? And we should stop calling these places prisons and jails. I've been inside of them. They're jail, they're, they're cages, okay? Neither of those things are good for this population of people, okay? Now you may begin to see our role in the profession, judges, prosecutors, and defenders hmm, in being the primary facilitators of mass incarceration, okay? And somebody's going to write this about my generation of lawyers, and I don't want them to do that. Defense counsel should advise against a guilty plea at the first appearance unless after discussion with the client, a speedy disposition is clearly in the client's best uh, 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 interest. Um, uh, this is routine. If you walk into any of these courtrooms, you will see it. They're, they're, uh, the first time the person is in a courtroom, they first meet their lawyer and bang, there's a plea and they're out of there and their life is destroyed. Okay? And they are not a threat to public safety. And I will, I will convince you of that later on in this talk. Now, let's look at the results of the uh, Missouri uh, report. The blue line represents should. Okay, that's what they should be doing on client communication. Huh? They should be doing a little under four hours on misdemeanors, communicating with your client to find out what happened, what's going on with this client. How can we humanize this person? How, we, how can we keep him out of uh, the criminal justice system? Find another remedy, okay? That takes a lot of time. You've got to humanize your client. you got to know, uh, you have to have a good social, uh, uh, what do they call it? I uh, forget the name of the thing. But anyway, you got to know his whole history or her whole history. Discovery or investigation. Look how much should be done. About four? How much is being done? <laughs> Less than a half an hour. On communication, it was also just about a half an hour. Uh, case preparation. We're going to prepare the case? Hmm? How much should be done? Okay. Look at the blue and look at the orange. Look at the total. This was about the total for what was actually being done. We, we did that by timekeeping. Missouri is a great public defender system, uh, which is throwing pearls to swine. Uh, and they were able to keep their time intensive an hour so they could show what they were doing. They were doing about 11.7 hours. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> they were doing about 2.2 hours. They should have been done, done according to the, the, um, this remarkable panel of experts we have. We got 400 years of criminal experience in the room, half public, half private. They should be doing 11.7, okay? How many, look, go back to Lucy and those cookies. And now, uh, how many of these people are falling on the floor uh, uh, and because their cases have not been adequately prepared, okay? Probation violation. Look at the difference between the blues and the oranges. A lower level felony, a CD felony. Look at the difference between the blues and the oranges. An AB felony, a high level felony. People going away to prison for a long time. Look at what should have been done versus what was done. Okay, this is embarrassing. A sex felony, you're really going away for a long time. Okay, but you'll also notice here that this orange line has been creeping up. Hmm? What does that tell you? It's getting a little closer to the blue. It's still not half of what it should be, but it's getting closer to the blue. What it tells you is public defenders are doing what you would expect them to do. It's understandable. It's also unethical, okay? Um, but they are pushing their resources to the higher risk cases, which is what you expect them to do. But it's, un it's both unconstitutional and more importantly, it's unethical. Now, a murder homicide are getting, you know, much closer, okay? So what happens when you do that in those higher risk cases? You throw everybody else under the bus, okay? That's a concurrent conflict. 
That means you don't have enough time, frankly, to represent the people in the murder cases. And really, you don't have enough time to represent the people uh, competently uh, in the uh, misdemeanor cases. So this is powerful evidence, okay? Nobody, we've litigated this case um, uh, several times in Missouri and down in Louisiana. Nobody's been ever, ever come up with an expert who says this is in any way mistaken, okay? <coughs> so we got the American Bar Association on this report. Reuben Brown, a nationally recognized accounting firm. Our services were performed in accordance with the statements on the standards for consulting services as prescribed by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. We got a certified report from a, uh, a, a, one of the nation's leading consulting and accounting, and accounting firms, okay? That's why no expert has come forward. James Sokonat, a very courageous president of the American Bar Association, upon the issuance of the Missouri report, it can now be more reliably demonstrated than ever before that for decades, the American legal profession has been rendering an enormous disservice to indigent clients and the criminal justice system in a way that can no longer be tolerated. That was 2014, and we're still in the battle. Notice that he didn't say, for decades, the public defenders have been rendering an enormous disservice. He said the whole profession, he didn't, he didn't pick out the prosecutors or the public defenders or the judges, the whole profession, okay? Uh, this cannot obviously be laid at the feet of public defenders. So now we've got the Missouri report. Now we're going forward, okay? Tom Schweik, we've responded to your question about not having something that, uh, where there was no there there. We've got something from the ABA. And we got something from a great accounting firm. Let's go forth into the courtroom. And here's a courageous public defender, Rod Hackathorn. He goes into, the, into his courtroom and he says, we will not assign an attorney until there is an attorney who can assume the representation without violating the rules of professional conduct. And that's the rule on concurrent conflict. That's the rule that says you will never represent uh, somebody when you have uh, too many uh, uh, clients so many clients that you can't be uh, competent. Imagine walking into a judge with, the judge has got 200 people in the courtroom in orange jumpsuits. Most of them are black and brown. And you're saying, judge, we're not gonna do this unless we can do this competently. And on these misdemeanor cases, we've been spending 2.1 hours. We need to spend 11.7. And we're not gonna come into your courtroom and just look at, meet our client for the first time and pleading to whatever's in the prosecutor's file. In other words, we're not going to be part of that processing system anymore. This is Luthi and Ethel saying, we're out of here. Okay? Now, what does the judge say? And listen to her. Okay? This is very important. Okay? I don't think I can overstate the impact this may have on our judicial system and our ability to process <coughs> criminal cases. We got it. We got the truth. She's not adjudicating criminal cases. She is processing them. Okay? That's when I started calling the system the criminal processing system. Okay? And the judges agree with me. That's what their job is. Okay? So the judge may sit up on a bench. Okay? And the judge may have a robe on. Okay? And the judge may even have a gavel. But they are not judges. And we should stop calling them judges. They are state processing agents. They're basically revenue generators. I know that's hard to hear, but it's the truth. Here's a great hero of mine, former Chief Justice of the Missouri Supreme Court. Beyond simply ensuring that counsel is appointed to assist every defendant who faces the possibility of imprisonment, a judge must also ensure that the defendant has effective, assist, effective is his underlining, effective assistance of counsel. Mm -hmm. So who has the primary duty to make sure that every single person who, occur, who appears in his or her courtroom has the effective assistance of counsel? The judge, okay? So uh, what is great, 
many of you have probably heard of the great John Paul Stevens, who was a highly respected uh, Supreme Court justice appointed by Gerald Ford. The vote was 98 to nothing to confirm uh, uh, Justice uh, Stevens. Remember those days. Uh, we certainly don't have anything like that uh, anymore. What does he say? And just looking back at this whole criminal justice system, who, who have we become? Hmm? Loyal foot soldiers in the executive's war on crime. That will be my legacy and the legacy of every lawyer in America to the next generation if we don't do something about that. And you can't find a more highly respected man to say such a thing. So to sum up, we're going to, you know, the world of is those orange little boxes I showed you. That's the actual practice in and out of court. Huh? The world of should, that's reasonably effective or competent, pursuant to prevailing professional norms. And that's the world we're interested in here. This is not ideal, okay? This is not F. Lee Bailey at his prime. It's just reasonably competent, okay? It's reasonable, okay? And lawyers know how to deal with the word reasonable, okay? Public defenders, every case, reasonable doubt. Reasonable is something juries understand. Reasonable is something lawyers understand. And now we've quantified it, okay? Now, Sun Tzu is one of my all-time heroes, the famous Chinese general. And before we go into litigation, I always go back and read The Art of War again. Every battle is won or lost before it is ever fought. It is won by the choice of terrain. So what court are we going to go in? Where are we going? What are we going to try and accomplish? Uh, we're probably not going to get total victory the first time out, but we have to be very strategic about where we are going. Okay. <clears throat> well, the first court we went in was the St. Louis County Circuit Court. Okay. This court finds, great Judge Beach, this court finds that the Reuben Brown calculations, that's a Missouri report, to be meaningful, and the court granted caseload relief to 16 St. Louis County public defenders based on the Missouri project. Hmm? First time out of the box, we win. A huge validation for the Missouri project report. Okay? And I'm thinking, well, I know better, you know. <laughs> but I'm very happy with the results, but I don't think the battle's over yet, okay? Now there's a new presiding judge who's come in. Her name is Janet, Judge Reno. Not Janet Reno, by the way. Her name was Gloria Reno. And uh, Judge uh, Beach has passed it off uh, to the public defender and the prosecutor and said, all right, those 16 public defenders, you put the Missouri report on them, those numbers, and tell me you know, which cases we can continue to hear and which cases are going to need to be uh, dismissed as a defendant. Uh, if, he, if he or she is in custody, uh, released. And then he retires. Judge Reno comes in. She's a new presiding judge. And she's looking at those numbers now, and she's been told what they mean. Okay. What does she say? Let's create a wait list for indigent defendants that the public defenders can't represent. Thousands of indigent Missourians then are in jail and out of jail with no lawyer. They're just waiting for one that might occur someday, might show up, maybe from the private bar. Not paid, not trained, not supervised, okay? It is stunning that a judge, and frankly a public defender, would agree to do that to those human beings, okay? They just sit there while witnesses disappear, memories fade, their case, nothing is done for their cases, okay? This is a horrible uh, solution, okay? And then she says, I am gonna um, be ethically sensitive. She says, we don't want her to be ethically sensitive. Uh, we want her to be ethically compliant, okay? And she said, I'm just not gonna apply the Missouri Project maximum caseload limits. Gives no reason. And she'll just pick and choose who goes to, she and the public defender can pick and choose who goes on the wait list and sits in jail. Or otherwise, 
is out of jail and their case isn't being treated. But it's not pursuant to any analysis, not pursuant to any data, okay? Because she knew what would happen if she applied that data. Because the Missouri public defender, we proved, had about three times as many cases as they could handle competently. Hmm? So that means you'd only handle the top third of your docket, and that would be limited to the, the, the uh, murder and the rape, and maybe some others, okay? Um, and certainly the highest risk cases. So the judiciary is now coming to grips with, uh-oh, this is, we've wanted to do this for 50 years and we've done it. And now somebody telling us we can't do this anymore. No fair, okay? So we go over to Kansas City, okay? And the first judge that we present the report to looks at the report and he says, what the Missouri report describes is not going on in my courtroom. Dismissed. You're not even going to get a hearing. <laughs> we, we try to say, judge, you know, that was the whole point of the report is that it's not going on in your courtroom. What's going on in your courtroom is the criminal processing system, and it is both unconstitutional and, more importantly, it's unethical. Okay? And, and the Missouri Supreme Court has told you, you can't do that anymore. Okay? Well, you're not going to have any of that. Okay, so he refuses to hear any evidence, dismiss the case. He gets reversed on appeal. I mean, that's, you know, that's uh, out of bounds, okay? So then we go, we say, uh, we, the, it comes back and there's a new presiding judge, okay? Judge Byrne, okay? And I testify uh, in his case. And he listens to my testimony, he said, Mr. Hanlon, I find that to be very instructive, very instructive. Thank you, Judge. But he says, I prefer the old meet them and plead them system, <laughs> okay? It's what I love, it's what I came, to, you know, I've come to know and love it, and it sure works for us, because you understand, Mr. Hamlin, I've got 200 people in this courtroom right now in orange jumpsuits, and most of them are black and brown, and I gotta move these people through here, okay? That's the old meet them and plead them system, okay? And that is affirmed by the Missouri Court of Appeals and by the Missouri Supreme Court. Now the Missouri Supreme Court has been hearing from Missouri lawyers and Missouri judges, and they're saying this Missouri report, we do not like this. We can't keep doing what we've been doing for 50 years, okay? So, the good thing about Judge Burns is he did a great job of describing the old days, the good old days of meet him and plead him. So there has three different components to them. The first one is that the preliminary handling and processing of those cases on larger dockets, this is 200 people in a room, with one docket attorney, the public defender, to handle those cases. He loves that, okay? You can really process them. This is Lucy and Ethel doing bang up work, okay? The early disposition docket, which has been an appropriate and efficient, hmm? it's efficient, it's not effective, but it's efficient manner to resolve cases. And then the no first felony policy where a public defenders do not allow a defendant to plead guilty to a first felony without a full and complete workup of the case. Actually, the law is you can't allow anybody to plead guilty without a full and complete workup of the case. But they just said, could we just do it for the first felony? And the judge said, no, I don't want you to do that. Okay. So you can see there is a massive clash here coming on between the public defenders, the judges, the prison system, the American Bar Association, uh, major accounting firms. And uh, that's why I think you've been hearing about this uh, in the New York Times and on PBS. Uh, and on 60 Minutes. They like conflict, and we have a lot of conflict to deliver here. So here's uh, some of the other examples of what was going on as the Missouri public defenders did what the Missouri Supreme Court told them to do. Here's a judge named Judge Standridge. This is, this is a quote from his order, okay? Some, you wouldn't believe me, I think, unless I put it up there in quotes, and you still may not believe me. The court having heard the public defender Walter Stokely assertion that he is unable to provide competent representation to both Mr. Davis and Mr. Stokely's other clients whose total open cases currently number, I can't see it there, but it was a lot. 
is hereby ordered to violate Missouri Supreme Court rule number four. That rule is the rule on concurrent conflict. It said a lawyer cannot represent more uh, uh, clients than uh, he or she can competently represent. And he orders them to enter into a full and not a limited uh, entry of appearance as attorney of record in the above numbered case. Okay. I hereby order you to violate the rules uh, of, of professional conduct that the judge swore to uphold, that the lawyers swore to uphold. Now we're scraping bottom here. We're really scraping bottom. So I say, well, I've had enough of Missouri. <laughs> I don't like the way I'm being treated in Missouri. And let's go to Louisiana. New Orleans is a wonderful city. The restaurants are fabulous. And there's a very courageous public defender down there and a great public defender system with wonderful data. I can prove my case with the data they have. They can tell you how many murders, high felony, mid felony, low felony, high misdemeanor, low misdemeanor, probation violations. They can tell you how many they have. Very few public defenders in America can do that. Okay? In this sissy pissy battle that they have uh, with all of the work that they have, that they can't do competently. They want to do it competently, and they're heroes and they're trying to do it, but they can't. So we put the case on. We do another study uh, in Louisiana, one of the eight that we've done. And uh, I testify and uh, I get my uh, accounting expert from uh, Louisiana's largest accounting and consulting firm, Postelweith and Netterville. So we have really powerful actors here to validate us. The American Bar Association, the L Louisiana's largest uh, accounting and consulting company, uh, um, and uh, uh, we go in and put that case on. It only takes me a day to lose, okay? Uh, once you've got the work done, it only takes a day to try the case. And we put the public defender on, and he describes how horrible it is. 12,000 cases in the division that we were in, one investigator. The judge almost fell off the bench when he heard that all these cases that he'd been hearing, none of them were being investigated. None, okay? Except for one investigator for 12,000 cases. Okay, uh, you talk about the criminal processing system. So I, you know, I'm down in Louisiana, you know, and I'm going to get a fair shake, right? Well, the judge says, why don't you each submit an order to me, and um, then I'll, that'll help me, you know, figure out what to do here. A proposed order. He just takes the prosecutor's order and signs it, just as it is, ignores ours, and uh, and and it, that included all the typographical errors in the prosecutor's uh, order. Well, as you can well imagine, the law in Louisiana and all over America is that order isn't worth the paper it's written on, okay? There was no judicial function going on. He just said, I want the prosecutor to win and signed it. So the good news, we go to the Court of Appeals in Louisiana. We got three judges on that Court of Appeals. Two of them are former prosecutors. We win. Total victory. Reverse. Follow the Waters case in Missouri. Provide a competent lawyer for every single public defender, uh, for uh, every single client of the public defender in Louisiana. And if you can't, dismissed. And if he's in custody, released. Total victory. Won't last long. Don't worry. <laughs> Louisiana Supreme Court. Uh, 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 we're not going to do that. <laughs> we had proven. And there was no expert to come in to testify to anything else. No, nobody disagreed with us uh, at trial that Louisiana lawyers had 20% of the lawyers uh, that they needed in order to be provide reasonably effective assistance to counsel pursuant to prevailing professional norm. 20%. And what do you do with the rest of the 80%? Got to dismiss them, Judge. But we'd say, don't do that. It took us 50 years to dig this hole. We're not going to dig out of it in one year. Let's go over five years, okay? 20% a year, okay? And we'll work on two things. Number one, let's get rid of those misdemeanors, okay? You don't need, they don't need, uh, uh, they don't need uh, uh, cages, and they certainly don't need convictions. They need social workers, mental health people, addiction people, et cetera, okay? So let's just get rid of them, okay? And that'll clear out, as you'll see, about 40% of the system, okay? And then uh, if you need some extra money, uh, I've got a, I've got somewhere to get you extra money. You don't have any more money in Louisiana. They don't have any more money in, in Missouri. 
Nobody has any more money in the States, especially after COVID, but that's been true for quite some period of time. But I got something for you. I'm not just going to come in here with a stick. I'm going to come in here with a carrot. And I'll tell you about that in a minute or two. So relief denied in the Louisiana Supreme Court. But God bless her, Chief Justice Bernadette Joshua Johnson's dissent. As she retires from the court, her last great dissent, there is no justice under law in Louisiana. Louisiana is proceeding in flagrant disregard of the United States Constitution, and I would add on, and the rules of professional conduct. So, what are we going to do about this? Well, we started off here with that little paper napkin uh, down at that bar in, uh, in San Diego with 150 felonies and 400 misdemeanors. And that's not a good thing, as uh, Auditor Schweik found. So I went to the RAND Corporation. Okay, The RAND Corporation, which invented the Delphi method, by the way, about 60 years ago, it's been peer reviewed, found to be reliable, for exactly what we're doing here. This is called a needs assessment study. I say, Rand, would you uh, do a, a, a study of all the studies that have been done? The ones that I did, the eight that I did with the ABA, and then there are about nine more, including some that you've done, Rand, and we'll come up with a new national numbers, okay, that will replace the 150 and 400, 150 felonies, 400 misdemeanors from 1973 with new national standards, okay? That will allow you to take about a third of that, uh, of that number of uh, felonies uh, and, and, and uh, misdemeanors. And Rand said, we're really interested in doing that. And I went to the ABA and I said, uh, how about you all, are you in? And the ABA said, we're in. And then I saved the best for last. I went to the National Center for State Courts their constituency is those trial judges who I've been fighting. Hmm? Would you do it? Yes. So now we have, and we all agreed in a 30-page document, single space, we've all signed off on what we're going to do, uh, this remarkable coalition of RAND, the ABA, the National Center for State Courts, and Lawyer Hanlon, and we're going to do a study of the studies. And then we're not just going to let that study sit on the shelf, okay? Here's some facts you need to know. The Brennan Center uh, for Justice is a remarkable institution. It's nonpartisan, and it issues a report, okay? And the report is entitled, How Many Americans Are Unnecessarily Incarcerated, okay? And my expert, a fellow named James Austin, who started his career as a prison guard, and then got his doctorate in statistical analysis and has been in America's prisons, some of them with me, Mississippi and elsewhere, uh, studying prison conditions in America and particularly the risk of release, who's a risk to, to reoffend and who's not, okay? He's the principal investigator for this Brennan Center report. And what did they say? Let's look over here on the left. Of the 1.46 million state and federal prisoners, an estimated 39% or about 576,000 people are incarcerated with little public safety rationale. They could be more appropriately sentenced to an alternative to prison or a shorter prison stay with limited impact on public safety. If these prisoners would release, it would result in cost savings of nearly two, 20 billion per year and almost 200 billion over 10 years. This sum is enough to employ 270,000 new police officers 360,000 probation officers, or 327,000 school teachers. You might wonder where in this, you know, massive prison industrial complex and massive criminal processing system, where do we get the money to do that? We got the money out of our school budgets. So our uh, grandchildren will also be probably asking us some questions about that. Now, where are we going to get the money to do this? Well, Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris, that's how you pronounce it, was a senator, as you know. She's no longer a senator. She's the vice president of the United States of America. She, and we worked with her on this, we helped her draft it, okay? She uh, introduced the Equal Defense Act, which would provide $1.25 billion for public defense over five years 
for qualifying public defender system. What do you mean qualifying? Well, you got good data, okay? And you can talk to Mr. Hanlon and his people and we can show you how to get the good data and we'll give you some money to, you know, get good data. And then you gotta provide, gotta get yourself in a, in a position where you can provide reasonably effective assistance to counsel pursuant to prevailing norms, professional norms, okay? So where's the 20 billion a year come from? Okay, or the 200 billion? Because when I, we talked with Chairman Jerry Nadler last Monday, uh, we don't just go in to say, Chairman Nadler, we want 1.25 billion over five years. We say, if you give us 1.25 billion over five years, we can save you 20 billion a year, uh, 100 billion over uh, five years and your streets will be safer. Hmm? And um, you will treat the people who are having these problems in a way that is designed to help them overcome their problems. It won't be a criminal conviction anymore that ruins their lives, and it won't be a cage which will ruin uh, their lives. And so that's the way you get the money under the Equal Defense Act. So we have a carrot and stick, okay? The carrot is, I'm going to sue you, okay? And I've got rock solid proof, okay? And nobody has challenged it. They've said, I don't like that and I don't want to do that. But nobody has said, you're in any way mistaken, okay? And here's the carrot. Here's the money. Do it out over five years, 20% a year. End of presentation. I'm really looking forward to questions and uh yeah, questions and answers. Um, so let's do that. Okay, yeah, there are, there are a number of questions, some are longer than others, and so we can get to, we'll try to get to them all. Um, oh, let me, let me get my screen out of here so they can okay. see me. It says stop share. Okay. Stop share. All right. Yeah, I see oh, you. I okay. See. Okay, good. Yeah, the one first question is like, um, and some are longer. <laughs> Be prepared. So the question is about cash bail. There has been discussions of eliminating cash bail. However, there is a critique of this. Could you elaborate on both sides of the argument to eliminate cash bail? Apparently, there are some unintended consequences. Well, um, there have been um, great efforts uh, in the abuse of bail to hold poor people simply because they're poor so that you can assure that they will show up for trial. It's been the law for well over half a century. You simply cannot do that, okay? And that's common practice. So there have been great reform in that area. What is a good reason to hold poor people who cannot afford bond? A good reason is that they are a threat to public safety or a threat to flee the jurisdiction, okay? Um, we know from our experiences and we've got about five years of data under our belt right now of systems that have greatly changed their bail systems for poor people in particular, okay? That the overwhelming majority of them, I mean, these numbers are up at 85, 90% are gonna show up for trial. It, it's not needed to get people to show up to, uh, to trial and that they're not gonna reoffend now. Here's where the question is probably coming from. And this is tough stuff, okay? Um, we are all human beings, okay? And we are all gonna make mistakes, okay? The Bible says the just man falls seven times a day. Mm -hmm. And that was meant to be infinite. Seven was used as an infinite number. And that was a just man. Can you imagine picking somebody out who you call a just man? That's pretty high praise. And you're going to fall seven times a day, okay? So what every judge is afraid of, okay, is that he's going to 
let somebody go, release on recognizance, and that person is going to reoffend. Okay, I've seen this. Uh, okay, it's a legitimate fear. But we cannot govern by anecdote. Okay, the cost, the human toil of the practice of unconstitutionally and illegally holding poor people in jail pending trial in order to assure, for no other reason, to assure their appearance at trial. We'll bring you from the jail over to the courthouse or maybe the jail's in the courthouse. Uh, has been astonishing, okay? And that cost outweighs the benefit of somebody who's gonna, you're gonna get it wrong despite the best data you have. And we have some very good data on risk of rearrest, okay? And risk of non-appearance. And every piece of data that we have tells us uh, that uh, the, 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 any cost benefit analysis would say, change that system, okay? Now we're gonna keep tinkering with it. It ain't gonna be perfect, okay? But the movement to eliminate uh, or dramatically reduce cash bail that horse has left the barn. Will there be mistakes made? Yes, there will. Um, are we gonna make fewer and fewer? Yes, we are, as we get better and better at it, because we're gonna get more and more data and better and better data. Okay, another question. Uh, how likely are judges appointed since 2017 to adhere to current ABA standards of practice? Um, without money, their question is, <laughs> you know, Steve, what's going to happen? Okay. Uh, you, you know, uh, you're telling me in Louisiana that you can do 20% of the cases at the high risk end. You can do cover the murders, the rapes, maybe some high felonies, but the rest, you know, has to go. And I say, well, judge, let's do it, you know. 20% a, a year at a time. Let's give it five years. Took 50 years to dig this hole. We're not going to dig out of it uh, overnight. And I got to get you the money. Okay. So, uh, and, and then we're going to be able to treat these people. And you're going to have dramatically improved outcomes. Uh, when you get somebody who really knows how to deal with addiction, judges have no idea. They have no training on addiction, on mental illness. Lawyers don't have training. I learned the rule against uh, the rule against perpetuities and the fertile octogenaria in law school. This has nothing to do with drug addiction or mental illness or homelessness or poverty. Okay, get people who have the right skills to deal with that population. We're going to have dramatically uh, improved outcomes. But I do not blame the judges uh, who say to me, "I can't do that." because I don't know where these people would get any treatment. We, we have to keep cages in effect and we, we have to keep convictions and collateral consequences in effect until you can replace it with something. And I think that's a legitimate request of the judiciary, okay? I get upset with them because they're violating the rules of uh, professional conduct and they're violating the constitution and they've done it for 50 years and I do get upset with them about it. But I understand when the court says to me, you've got to give me something in return. And I'm going to get them something in return. And I think we'll have, um, we'll have the, um, uh, the new national numbers uh, by the first quarter next year. Uh, and they'll be incorporated into the Equal Defense Act. And uh, I'll, have, I'll be able to go, you know, I, I know where I want to start. And, and say, here, I got you the money. Let's, let's get a program over five years to stop the insanity that the criminal process system is. And then I think they'll respond real well. You could, you know, you could argue that I'm trying to bribe them, but right. I, I'm not trying to bribe them. I'm just trying to give them a remedy that will mm -hmm. work rather than cages and convictions and collateral uh, consequences. Okay, here, this is the multi-part question. <laughs> I have to be patient. Is it, it is known what people is it known what people who commit crimes consider when deciding whether or not to do something they know is illegal? Do they, the proposed revisions address these con considerations to encourage better decision-making in the future? And the other thing is do improved 
support systems for offenders result in better decision making? Well, that's a great question. We know a little bit about it. And also the, the follow is, would a triage strategy work to address the, uh, the process problems? What was the triage question? Would a triage strategy to address ju justice process problems help reduce recidivism and therefore allow more time for attorney interaction with clients? Yeah. Um, let me answer the first question. I'll do- uh, Yeah, it's, it's four. <laughs> do the first question first. This is not my area of expertise. Um, the mind of the criminal before the criminal does the criminal action, right? Um, uh, I don't, first of all, consider drug addiction uh, and mental illness uh, criminal. Um, uh, nor do I think poverty is criminal and nor do I think homelessness is criminal. So for about 40% of the system, we're not, um, we're not really talking about the criminal mind. We're talking about people who, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, don't have the capacity to make uh, good uh, decisions. But when you're talking, I think what the question is really directed to is, you, you know, somebody who does violence and uh, really harms uh, another person, and uh, that's the pe that's what people are concerned. And of course, killing uh, somebody. And um, the question is, I, I think can be boiled down to, would the fear of prison mm, uh, deter such a person? Would it have any deterrent uh, effect? And everything that I know, and again, this is not my area of expertise. Uh, I wish I had Jim Austin here because Jim could really tell you about that. Um, oh. uh, is that the, the answer to that is largely no. The fear of prison does not. Um, and um, certainly for young people, there's frontal lobe development issues. Uh, there's a lot of other things that I, um, I, I don't know. I think we do prison to deter the person from doing the thing further for a while, while hopefully we can work on all of those problems uh, that went into that frontal lobe problem. Uh, up there, but I, again, I, 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 that's that's all I know on it. Now, triage and uh, reducing uh, recidivism. The best uh, evidence I have on this uh, question is uh, San Francisco. Um, I have a great public defender out there, a fellow named Jeff Adachi, and again, Jeff is not with us anymore and tragically died a couple of years ago. He was a great public defender. <clears throat> And, um, excuse me here. Jeff um, stepped back and looked at the data. Jeff had very good data. And he called a meeting of the police, all the stakeholders, the police, uh, the prosecutors, city government, everybody, and said, here's the data I got, okay. Um, San Francisco, uh, has a clearance rate. This is 15 years ago. San Francisco has a clearance rate for murder. Clearance rate means you solved the crime somehow. You made an arrest, okay? Our uh, clearance rate for murder is now 30%. In other words, if you commit a murder in San Francisco 15 years ago, there was a better than two to one chance you'd get away with it. So he said, what's wrong with this picture, okay? You don't want this. I don't want this. And the first thing everybody said was, we need more money. And then everybody said, well, there is no more money. Okay, well, what else can we do? Well, how much of your system right now are you expending on this lower 40% that the Brennan Center would eventually identify? Well, it's a stunning amount of money. Okay, a stunning amount of money that you spend to arrest them, jail them, feed, clothe, house, medical, mental health, um, prosecute them in the courts with the bailiffs and the <laughs> juries and on and on, <laughs> and then incarcerate them. Again, free food, clothing, housing, medical, and mental. Okay, it's a staggering amount of money. Okay, 
which again, we have taken out of our school systems. That's where we funded mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Uh, now, they said, I'll tell you what, let's divert those 40%. Let's stop arresting those people and see what happens. If you kill somebody, they did that over a period of about 10 years. If you kill somebody in San Francisco today, you know what your, um, uh, 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 what, what the clearance, uh, what your chance of getting away with it is? The clearance rate in San Francisco for homicide right now is 90%. It went from 30 to 90. There is a tremendous misallocation of resources into, you know, arresting people who are driving while black, our sex workers, our you, you know, public nuisance or whatever. And all that takes resources. If you would shift it over here, you're going to have a much better, uh, mm -hmm. your homicide, right. you're going to have a much better outcome. We have quite a few more questions <laughs> to get to. Uh, can an attorney be held in contempt of court for refusing to take an additional case or cases? What recourse does the attorney have if uh, the judge says, you know, you, well, okay. <laughs> what recourse does the attorney have? If the judge says, you know, um, you have to do hold, you have to take the case or, or not take the case, you know. Yeah. So for, first of all, attorneys in Missouri have been threatened with contempt. Uh, I didn't have them in the slideshow, I probably should. Uh, uh, absolutely, they're being threatened with contempt. Uh, and what they would do if they were held in contempt, would they take an appeal, okay? And uh, that, that order would uh, uh, hopefully be overturned, but uh, not necessarily. So th there's a huge risk to these uh, lawyers. Um, and uh, uh, their, their recourse, well, when the, when the Hinkabine case was argued in the Missouri Supreme Court, the defender said the, the, the exact same thing. He said, Judge, what am I supposed to do? You're telling me on the one hand, if I, take, if I don't take the cases, I'm going to be held in contempt. And on the other hand, if I do take the case, I'm going to be disbarred. And you know what the judge's answer was? Quit your job. <laughs> and the judges gave very good legal advice there. You can't let anybody put you in between uh, Scylla and Charybdis that way. Um, so this thing is coming to a head, okay? We're gonna to have to face it. Okay, another question. Uh, did you bring the Missouri study results to the Missouri State Legislature? If so, what was their response? Great question. If, if not, why yeah. not? I went down and testified to the Senate Appropriations Committee and the Senate Judiciary Committee and the Senate Appropriations Committee for the first time to my knowledge uh, in all of American history, we said, here's what we need under the Reuben Brown American Bar Association report, the Missouri report. And the appropriations committee said, you got it. Didn't take a dime away. Of course the governor vetoed it, okay? And every time the Missouri uh, Senate offered any uh, increase in, in uh, appropriations, the governor was always vetoing it or slicing it, okay? In fact, that same year that he told the public defenders, no, you're not going to get it, he put aside two or $3 million to build a public park. Okay, so we know <laughs> we're not exactly the most welcomed uh, beggars uh, for public money. Okay. Um, yeah, another one. Um, what were the crimes already committed by those people who the Brennan report considers low risk. How was low risk determined? Well, and again, that's not my um, area of expertise. That's Jim Austin's. Okay. But but uh, I can I mean, I've read the report and uh, yeah, you can um, uh, categorize. I mean, we've criminalized everything in sight. Uh, fishing with illegal bait would be in there. I mean, the, the idea that, that, that you can be punished up to one year in prison for fishing with illegal bait is, is mind-boggling. And every other thing you can think of in terms of public nuisance and this and that and the next, none of this has anything to do with public safety. We're not as scared of these people. We're upset with them, or at best we're concerned about them. Uh, and I, I, you know, the list is endless. 
Now, there's going to be some debate. Okay, first of all, it would not include a domestic violence misdemeanor. Okay, probably wouldn't include any violent crime unless it was really peanuts. Um, uh, but uh, but at the edges, I think prosecutors and defenders and criminologists will work that out. But I don't get paid to do that. Okay, this might be a hard question, especially for your area. <laughs> With the calls for defund the police, how do we make sure that the police um, include folks who are truly understand the people in those jurisdictions as individuals and not stereotype groups? Well, uh, we've... Um, um, how do we make sure there's enough social work? First of all, let's start with this. Yeah. The phrase defund the police is idiotic and should never be used again, okay? I think it came out of the streets. Uh, unfortunately, I think at least one member of the squad has used it. Uh, it, it it's, it's a horrible uh, thing uh, and it shouldn't be used. Repurposing the police, retraining the police um, is uh, a, a huge job. Much of what police do could be done better by others who have training, real training in the principles of de-escalation. Um, I've ridden with cops, okay? I've ridden uh, in the worst areas of town, overnight, Friday night, starting at 10 o'clock in the night and ending at five o'clock in the morning. And the job that these guys are, uh, and gals are, 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 uh, have is an extremely complex job, okay? And the training and the compensation for people who do stuff that really involves safety and risk uh, just has to be infinitely better than it was. We've had all, all on, until five years ago, as late as five years ago, there was virtually no funding for training, federal funding for training police in the principles of de-escalation. That is about 95% of their job. They get trained for the 5% the of their job that involves guns and violence and risk. So we've got a complete misallocation of resources on what to do with the police. There are plenty of social workers, mental health experts, uh, and um, uh, addiction experts who can do much of the work that takes up a uh, policeman's right. time for right. which they are not trained. Right. We're running kind of short on top. I think we have about <laughs> three minutes, maybe four minutes left. Okay, so I might have to race through some of these questions. Um, what states have changed their public defender systems and and how is it going? Is it working? Good question. With rare exception, um, the, the system that I have described to you is in effect all over America. It is not in effect in San Francisco. Okay, and of course, they're, 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 the, the effect on, well, it's not an effect in San Francisco and it's a great success in the, in the kinds of th things that I was talking about. It's not an effect in Washington, D.C. There is no misdemeanor docket in either one of those cities uh, for all intents and purposes, okay? If, if it involves violence, it'll, it'll come into the court, but uh, there essentially is no misdemeanor docket in either of those places. Massachusetts, in some places, is, uh, is well-funded. There are a few spotty ones all over. But other than that, this is a national and international disgrace. Nobody does this anywhere else in the Western world. Nobody. Our system is the most efficient system known to the Western world. We put people in jail faster, quicker, uh, and with less uh, uh, consideration than any other Western democracy. There's no question about that. Well, kind of a follow-on question is, is uh, what do our other um, industrialized countries, they don't have the, our incarceration numbers. What do they do differently? Oh, uh, <laughs> well, their cultures are entirely different. Um, they don't have the kinds, as you all know, I mean, they don't have the kinds of gun violence that we have. Uh, they have a more civilized society. I mean, I live in St. Louis City, okay? This is the most dangerous city in the Western world to live, 
Okay, the murder rate here is higher than it is anywhere else. And the solve rate or the clearance rate is around 30 or 35 percent for murder. Okay, so we have to ask ourselves as a society, um, is this what Jefferson and Hamilton and uh, all those folks had in mind uh, for a, a uh, you know, a constitutional democracy? Uh, we can't protect our children from mass shootings in schools. Um, uh, we just got to, I mean, if you go on our television, all you, know, all you see is people killing one another. I mean, we got a culture that we really have to, you know, uh, worry about. Uh, because culture means more than law. It just does. And it can do more than law. Uh, and progressives like me tend to put too much emphasis on uh, law and uh, conservatives put more emphasis on culture. And the conservatives have something to teach us uh, there. So, yeah, we are, yeah, we are kind of running out of time here. All right. What was your, what was your name for you, instead of calling um, judges judge, what was your label for the processors? <laughs> the judge's judge? Yeah, what did you what was your label for a judge? In other words, you had another name for judge. Oh, I think they are state uh, uh, processing revenue agents. Yeah, I think that's, that's what they they're there to do. Uh, <laughs> that is, certainly for the lower 40% of the system, that's what they do. Uh, and it's true well into the higher risk part. Uh, of, hmm. There are only 5% of these cases, and I don't, I don't believe that, but the data says there are only 5% of these cases in state courts that ever go to trial. There are only 3% right. in uh, federal courts. So, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know why you'd want to go to law school for three years and do that. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. Why would you want to be a prosecutor? And always, right. Why would you want to be a prosecutor and always go up against a lawyer who couldn't competently represent his clients. I mean, I good lawyers say, I want another good lawyer in the courtroom. When I'm in a courtroom, I want a good lawyer on the other side. If I got somebody who's, you know, Carl Hinkebein and he's got files all over the place and everything, that's no fun trying that case. So I don't understand why prosecutors uh, oppose me. I would think they would love it. So you could get down, you'd have a real opponent on the other side and you try things that involve real crime. I think that would be a very enjoyable job, but I'd go, nuts if I were a prosecutor today and all I'm doing is, you know, processing 90, 95% of my cases. That's not a job that takes three years of law school. Okay. I think that's the final question. Uh, why not stop arresting people for minor infractions? In other words, change some laws rather than limit caseloads or hire more public defenders. Well, that's yeah, my question. Why not? Do we need more lawyers? <laughs> well, the short answer is it's a supply and demand question. It's an economic question, okay? Um, you got to get demand side relief first. That means you got to shrink the criminal justice system, okay? And we have conservatives who are really, really with us on that. Um, we just have to end the criminalization of uh, poverty, homelessness, mental illness, and, and addiction. So that gives you good demand side relief. That's less coming into the system. Then we also have to, we, there's only so much money we got now. Even 1.25 billion sounds like a lot, a lot, but when you spread it over five years over the, all over the country, it's not gonna go that far. You also have to, these draconian sentences where people are in for 30 and 40 years for really minor crime. You have to do sentencing reform, okay? Because the more years that a person could be subject for prison, the more time the public defender has to put in the case. You saw the charts, right? okay? So we got to shrink that system first, and then we got some leftover money that we can help, uh, th then we can throw money after something good. But to go in right now and throw 1.25 billion at a bloated uh, and busted, broken system would be crazy. Mm. Okay, I think we're, we are out of time. <laughs> All right. Great presentation. You've gotten a lot of, uh, you know, positive responses. You know, really people love the presentation. Good. Uh, to all the participants of the audience, if, if you want to uh, you send a personal message, the chat is open, so you can send a personal message, you know, that, to, to, uh, to Steve that, you know, what you thought of the presentation. 
but anyway, I thought it was terrific. I, I learned a lot in this um, about the you know criminal justice and, and reform and it gets down to it really gets down to caseload. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, yeah. okay. So uh, um, uh, if you want to follow my work, I'll say it again, just do uh, Google up Lawyer Hanlon and you'll get uh, my website and I'll be posting progress reports on uh, what we're doing because uh, we'll be doing an awful lot in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Well, that's great. Thank you.